Welcome to week 4 of the class Neural Dynamics. In the previous two weeks, we have developed rather detailed biophysical neuron models. We started off with models of the hodgkin huxley type with different ion channels. Last week, we added synapses and added dendrites. So, if you look at one of these detailed models, it has a rather complicated structure. There are maybe 75 different ion channel types. There might be many different ion channels distributed across a dendrite with many, many compartments. And such a detailed neuron model is indeed capable of reproducing many phenomena of real neurons. However, the aim of a model is to understand what's going on in nature, to describe natural phenomena. If the neuron model itself is so complicated, it becomes hard to understand it, then the question arises, what can we do? Is it possible to arrive at a simplified description, which is easier to understand, where we can grasp the essence of phenomena, where we can develop mathematical tools to really analyze what's going on? And that's the topic for this week. So, last week we looked at detailed neuron models. For example, we made a model of such a pyramidal neuron in cortex. Now, such a pyramidal neuron has a rich dendritic structure. And we have seen last week that there are active processes in a dendrite that give rise to a ping-pong between backpropagating action potentials generated at a soma and dendritic spikes. Now, these active processes exist. The question arises whether these and other neurons would show such active ping-pong-like processing in an in vivo situation. If the neuron is embedded in a real brain, involved in a real processing task, sensory processing, memory retrieval, are these active processes important? We don't really know. Other neurons might not have these active processes at all. If you assume that the dendrite is passive, then indeed the main function of the dendrite is to provide a filtering. Signals that arrive in the upper branches of the dendrite give rise to a filtered input at the soma. But all the decisions about generating the action potential or not are taken at the soma. And in this case, in the case of a passive, or mainly passive dendrite, it's possible to reduce the description to that of a point neuron model. Now, even a hodgkin huxley type point neuron model may have many different ion channels embedded in the membrane, and these ion channels open and close depending on the state of the environment. Now, with 75 different ion channel types, such a model is still a rather complicated model. Ion pumps and ion channels give rise to complicated behavior. As we have seen, ion pumps give rise to a difference in voltage via a concentration difference. And this, in the end, gives rise to the reversal potential. Ion channels can be described by their conductances. And these conductances, for example, are conductance for the sodium channel or the potassium channel or the leak channel. The conductance of a sodium channel depends on these gating variables like M and H, and each of these gating variables has a complicated dynamics. M likes to go towards M0 with some time constant tau M. H likes to go towards H0 with some time constant tau H. And N, for the potassium current, N likes to go towards N0 with some time constant tau N. Now I say time constant tau n, but it's not really a constant because this time constant depends on the voltage u. Similarly, the target value or equilibrium value depends on the voltage u that's presently valid in the membrane. So with three different types of ions, sodium, potassium and leak, one type of ion channel for each type of ion. We have already four differential equations 
you can also say we have a four-dimensional system of differential equations. Now, four-dimensional differential equations are still rather complicated. It's not easy to understand the dynamics in such high dimensions, and four is a big number in that context. So how can we understand the dynamics of the Hodgkin-Huxley model, given that it's formulated in four dimensions? How can it be that some Hodgkin-Huxley models show a smooth Fi curve of the type 1, others show a jumpy Fi curve, which means type 2, with just a small change of parameters? Can we understand these different types of neuron model? Can we understand the threshold behavior? When does the model will send out a spike? When does it not respond with a spike? Well, all of these phenomena can be understood if you reduce the system from four to two equations. And that's the aim for this first lecture. Now, in order to go from four dimensions to two, we have to use two mathematical tools, two mathematical tricks. And the first one is the separation of time scale. So here are the four equations of the Hodgkin-Axley model in their full beauty written out. There's a voltage equation, then there's the equation of the variable m, which enters in, in the, into the sodium channel. There's an equation for, for the variable h, which also enters into the sodium channel. And then there's a variable n, which controls the potassium channel. m likes to go towards m0, its equilibrium value, with some time constant tau m. h likes to go towards its equilibrium value, with some time constant tau h. Now these time constants, as I mentioned before, are voltage dependent. And the first observation we make is that the time constant for m is much, much shorter, it's smaller than that for h. It's also smaller than that for n. So in that sense, m is fast. So if for the moment we assume that the stimulus is some constant drive, then the whole dynamics is controlled by the interaction between the voltage variable, the gating variable m, the gating variable h, the gating variable n. Now, the m variable reacts with the time constant tau m, which is small, to changes in the voltage. Tau m is much smaller than all the other time constants in the system. And therefore, we can say m is a fast variable. It's faster than the others. And m approaches its value. m likes to go towards m0 with a time constant tau m. And tau m is short, so m sort of goes instantaneously towards m0. That means at any moment in time, we can imagine that m has already approached its value m0 for the momentary voltage u. So this is the idea of separation of time scale. One of the variables is fast, or a group of variables are fast, and these fast variables have already approached their instantaneous equilibrium value. The details of this argument will be given in the next lecture. So, the dynamics of M are fast. Now, the second observation is that the dynamics of H and N are sort of of similar speed. If I compare tau N, here hand, some hand-drawn figure, with tau H, it's not the same, but it's roughly in the same range n approaches n0 and h approaches h0 and both do that with a time constant which is similar. Tau h and tau n are similar. Now, obviously, 
the curves, the equilibrium curves for N0 and for H0 are not similar at all. However, they are sort of a mirror image of each other. Suppose I'm here at a resting value of the voltage. There's no external current. The system has equilibrated. And this at this resting state, N has a certain value and H has a certain value. Now, while H goes up, sorry, while N goes up, H will go down. So it's sort of, a, they behave one in a mirror image of the other. And while H gets small, N gets big. Or while N gets small, H gets big. If you compare the value here, that's the momentary value of N, with the value 1 minus H, then they are sort of similar to each other. They are not perfectly similar. That's why I've put a arbitrary constant A, a scaling constant, between the two. So here's again during a again the same kind of picture, but during constant current injection. The current injection starts here at time 20 milliseconds, and you see that N of T increases periodically during the spikes, and at the same moment, H of T decreases. So the two curves form mirror images. The dynamics of the two is sort of similar. And that's what we have expressed by this equation here. The details of the argument will be given in the third lecture. But let's put these insights together. So, the Hodgkin-Huxley model has a sodium current. It's controlled by the momentary value m of t of the gating variable m and by the momentary value of the gating variable h. The potassium current is controlled by the momentary value of the gating variable n. I stress momentary value and that's why I've written explicitly n of t. This is one of the variables. Other variables are u of t, and then there's an external input, which can be constant or time-dependent. Now, we said the dynamics of m are fast, so m can be replaced by its momentary value, m0. So, I put that in, m0 of u of t. Now, before m was an independent variable, now m0 of u is just a readout of a lookup table. m0 of u evaluated at the momentary value, u of t. And then m goes to the third power. Now, the dynamics of h and n are similar, and for both, I will introduce a new variable. 1 minus h will be written as w, a times n will be written as w. So if 1 minus h is equal to w, then h is 1 minus w. And that's what I put in here. 1 minus w of t. And then I copy u of t minus e n a. Now, n, a times n is w, so n is w over a. Let's insert this in here, w of t over a constant a to the power of 4 u of t minus ek, and the rest does not change. I can copy it, u of t minus el plus i of t. 
Let's rewrite this. I have a voltage equation. This is the voltage variable. And the voltage variable appears here on the right hand side. It appears here. It appears here. And it appears there. This is my first variable. Then I have a second variable. The second variable is W. It appears here. And it appears here. And that's it in terms of variables. We started off with four variables, M, H, N, and the voltage U. We end up with two variables, one for the voltage and one for W. Now, each of the gating variables, N and H, had an equation N likes to go towards N0, H likes to go towards H0. And so it's not surprising that there should be some dynamics for this new variable W. W likes to go towards W0 with some effective time constant, which itself is voltage dependent. So I have here my voltage equation. And here I have my W equation. And uh, together, they form a two-dimensional system of equations. Some function on the right-hand side of the momentary voltage, the momentary W. Again, here's the voltage, here's the voltage, here's the voltage, here's the voltage, here's W, and here's W. And the W equation is also it depends on the voltage, here's the voltage, and it depends on W, here's W. So we have a two-dimensional system of equations as a result. So let me summarize what we have seen. Exploiting the difference of time scales, we can use the mathematical trick, separation of time scales, so as to replace the M variable by its instantaneous value. Moreover, W represents an effective variable, and that's, that W variable exploits the similarities in the dynamics between H and N. As a result, the four-dimensional system of equations has been reduced to two dimensions. As we will see in the following, two-dimensional systems of equations are Beautiful. They are nice. They are nice because you can use graphical tools to analyze the system. You can understand the difference between a type 1 and a type 2 neuron model. You can understand, understand threshold behaviors. You can understand repetitive firing. So once you are in two dimensions, you have an, immense, uh, um, you have an immense amount of tools available in order for you to understand the dynamics of action potential generation in neurons. Before we continue, please have a look at our quiz.